So I'd like to thank everyone for coming and joining us today. We have a great presentation here talking about how to become a science illustrator. Um, we are very lucky to have designs that sell to, uh, designs that sell uh, here with us today. They are scientific illustrated. Uh, illustration company specializing in creating custom figures for scientists, clinicians, and trainees. Um, so they're the first research-focused scientific illustration company in Canada, and they currently conduct their own research on focus on communicating scientific concepts to lay audiences. We have three people, three amazing women from uh, Designs That Sell with us here today. We have Sarah, Natasha, and Naomi. Sarah founded Designs That Sell in 2017 as a space where science artists such as herself and others can combine their scientific foundation with the visual communication skills to illustrate the idea of other members of the scientific community. She's a senior illustrator at Designs That Sell and oversees all the operations. She obtained her master's of science from Queen's University and is currently completing her PhD in microbiology and immunology from Dalhousie. Natasha is a, is a science communicator who's passionate about using visual knowledge to translate strategies to promote equity and improve population health. She joined the Design That Cell in 2018 and first as an illustrator and social media manager. Her role has evolved as the company has grown to include client management, marketing, and research. She completed her Master's of Science from Queen's University and recently obtained her Master's of Public Health from Science Fraser University. We also have Naomi, who's uh, passionate about using visualization and, uh, to communicate science, medicine, and health. In September, she will be attending the University of Toronto's Biomedical Communications Program, one of the four accredited master's level programs focusing on medical visualization in North America. She's, she joined that program to further hone her scientific communication skills. She earned her Master of Science from the University of Guelph, where she focused on uh, education and human anatomy. There, she also founded the Human Anatomy Art Association. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Sarah, who's going to take over, take us up and help us learn about science illustration and that entrepreneurial path as well. Awesome. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Is that showing up okay for everybody? Awesome. Um, so I'm so excited to be here. And thank you, Jason, for the introduction. And thank you to Or for inviting us and uh, collaborating with us to provide this opportunity. It's quite a unique topic and you don't see a lot of webinars focused on this for trainees. So I'm excited and I'm uh, seeing a lot of introductions for people who are part-time science illustrators or curious about getting into scientific illustration. And so we've really catered this talk towards you and we have some bonus resources but are also welcoming questions about any specific thing you might want to ask us about. Um, as my Disclaimer before this presentation, I'd like to say Natasha, Naomi, and myself all have different experiences, but we do come from a health science background. And as you'll find out, there are no proper one-way road to becoming a scientific illustrator. And hopefully you'll be able to pick that up yourself, but also know that you don't have to necessarily have a health science background um, to be a scientific illustrator. So to start off, I'm going to take us through my path uh, to scientific illustration and then also focus on how to turn your passions into profit, specifically um, in the context of designs that sell as a startup. And so I first want to start to talk about where my path diverged from science and art when I was in high school applying to Ontario universities. Um, for some of you who have applied to school here, you'll know that OUAC is an online program where you pick three programs of your top choice um, as a minimum. And my three programs were painting, industrial design, which is a form of um, environmental design at OCAD University, as well as environmental sciences from the University of Guelph. And um, like many 17 year olds, I really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do and so I kind of just picked programs that aligned with my passions for art painting um, and as well as uh, being outside and going camping and hiking and so this path was a really difficult one to take um, I ended up choosing science and attending the University of Guelph with some uh, input from invested individuals including my parents um, because they felt that it was a more secure job field um, which isn't totally incorrect. Um, however, I'm hoping that today you'll be a little convinced about the role that art plays in science. And so I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph, and that is where I met Naomi. Um, and I did my first year in environmental sciences and also spent a lot of time switching around majors at Guelph. 
um, I decided that I really wasn't interested in policy or law, and so I ended up taking basic biology for a year. Um, and then was introduced to a friend who was doing a research project and absolutely was fascinated. Um, as a first generation graduate student, I hadn't been exposed to that as a potential route. And so I was really excited to switch into the biomedical sciences program, um, which Naomi also attended, and she'll tell you about her experience. And then I completed my undergraduate degree with an honors research project that I ended up loving. And as you can see here on the right, um, use these uh, types of experiments to begin my science communication and mixing in art with science and bringing back some of those things that I hadn't really been using those skills during my first few years um, to be able to harness uh, art and visual communication to communicate my research topics. And so that's how it became reintroduced into my world. Just to give an example of this, one of my fourth year topics um, in a cancer biology seminar course um, it was this very complicated title, which probably doesn't mean much to a lot of you, but you can see this was done in 2016, um, and I had a really hard time trying to explain to people um, the many layers of this complex topic, and specifically with cancer immunotherapy, there's, you know, all these cells that are named the same thing, but are not really the same thing, so any immunologists out there will probably laugh at this, but um, I like to assign different characters or different uh, storytelling strategies when I am trying to communicate a scientific topic because it makes it a lot easier for people who might not be familiar with all the jargon or terminology to be able to follow through with your presentation. So this is just a fun example of something that, you know, was not really founded in the idea of, oh, I'm going to draw these tumor cells from art from scratch, but it was an easy photoshopping on PowerPoint and changing the colors of things that took five minutes, which really enhanced the understanding of the presentation. And so knowing this um, and knowing that I wanted to continue in research because I was so inspired about this, um, I continued to incorporate custom illustrations into my presentations. Um, so this is one example of something I used for my seminar at Queen's. And it was an animated illustration that showed the different components uh, explaining metastasis or cancer spread from a primary location to a secondary location. And through this, um, as I was quickly putting together presentations, it caught the attention, as I'm sure many of you have experienced of other people saying, oh, can you make the one illustration or oh, can you uh, fix up this figure for a presentation or a publication? Um, and eventually I learned that there, were, there was a lot of value in this skill and it wasn't something that was very popular or inherent. And so um, I ended up creating something that I didn't intend to, which was a brand for my science. And so what ended up happening was that people were talking about my science and talking about my experiments because of my illustrations. So um, art really helped amplify the basic science concepts that I was working on in the lab. And I, I thought that was extremely cool. And so knowing that this is something that could have been monetized and with a unique skill, I saw that I had some em employment opportunities, some that came to me and some that I saw out. Uh, the first that came to me was the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, for which I did a volunteer um, commitment with a organization that was related. And so I created some infographics for them, um, and they were really happy with them and decided to hire me on as a summer student while I was completing my master's degree. And for them, I created a variety of lay infographics that were really focused on knowledge translation uh, with the intent of communicating complex clinical trial information about cancers that are hard to treat or that people might um, have failed primary treatment with. And so it walked them through that process. And some of the things that um, I illustrated, funny enough, came back to those uh, immunology characters to explain immunotherapy. Um, in addition to that, I also worked for the Queen's Bachelor of Health Sciences program, which was an online program created specifically for health sciences and specifically for um, these students. And it was all online, which meant that they relied very heavily on visual communication. And so for their programs, like many of you, you might you know, want to highlight a specific pathway or talk about a specific anatomical um, area that isn't classically highlighted in textbooks or you can't really find the right illustration online. And so they wanted to, again, brand their science and brand their course and course development material to match a specific look. And so they hired um, both myself and another scientific illustrator to essentially create all those custom illustrations for them. And so through these experiences, I realized that there was a pretty significant problem in our fields. 
um, that being that we have this need to communicate our science now more than ever, especially um, with CIHR identifying this as a key mandate and a component of a strategic plan. So now having to incorporate knowledge translation makes it into something that you know us artists aren't having to advocate for, but it's become very clear that this is a key component of being able to communicate science and for science to be seen successfully. Um, and, and so in addition to scientists, there are other individuals who have stakes in being able to communicate properly, including clinicians, so doctors having to communicate things with their patients. Um, as somebody who uh, was in medical school for a while, I know that engaging with patients can be really challenging when you're trying to explain things about their own health that they really should be empowered to understand, they can't, and it's the same for public health practitioners, which Natasha will talk a little bit about. And so they're left with this question about how do I get this illustration done or how do I communicate the science? Um, and the result is that, you know, these individuals who didn't go to school for art or design or communication spend an immense amount of time and energy creating tools that really don't communicate the science as well as they could be. Um, or they end up hiring graphic designers who don't really understand the science and consequently what happens is that you kind of misrepresent the point or you even misrepresent the science having inaccurate illustrations. Um, and the last is what this meme is referring to which is that graduate students are often assigned these tasks because they do take so long and so you take up a lot of time creating the perfect illustration for a poster or a presentation um, and don't actually get to spend time on the science. So. Obviously, this is a problem, and what is the solution? The solution for us was scientific illustrations. Um, and so the terminology and nomenclature around illustrating and visual communication is still developing because it is a new field. Um, the term medical illustrator and scientific illustrator are often used interchangeably. Um, I think about them as something that's separate, and I only will talk a little bit more about the medical illustrator component, but I find that this is something something that more directly relates to medicine or anatomy. Whereas I see scientific illustrators as something that is evidence-based that is really focused on communicating the research or the outcome of that research rather than trying to visually represent, let's say, a part of a surgery, which is important in its own right as well. Um, but the one thing that I think science illustrators need to have that medical illustrators might not necessarily need to be trained in is the science communicating piece um, because when we're illustrating science or communicating other people's research there's an aspect of being able to do that effectively and not just um, in a way that looks nice if that makes sense because beautiful art is beautiful but it might not always be the best way to be presenting information and so the solution is to create something that scientists would be able to go on and uh, request an illustration that was customizable that they could target their um, their results towards and doing this in a way that evidence based we do everything else in science in a way that has a protocol that has an approach and visually communicating our science really shouldn't be any different. Um, I love this Venn diagram I, as an artist I love Venn diagrams generally um, but this Venn diagram particularly because what you see here is all the characters that are similar characteristics that are similar between art and science, but there are more in the middle than you see on either side. And I think that you know all scientists have creativity. We like experimenting, we like these things, which are very similar to how artists approach new projects, new ideas. Um, you know, it's really fun to try a new technique or see a style that somebody else does and say, hey, that looks awesome, let me um, put my own spin on it. And so this diagram was created she has great art and she's also a PhD student who I love to support so her Twitter is there as well and she has great content. And so obviously the next thing is when you put this hat on is this a market that is useful or worthwhile getting into? Um, and the answers in the stats and in uh, the numbers as a scientist like to see so um, you can look at the graph design business in Canada where it's a 1.5 billion dollar revenue projected for 2020 um, and the growth rate is good as well which essentially means that this is not going anything it's, it's an industry that's growing um, right now currently in the graphic design industry a lot of individuals uh, most individuals are freelancers that's not to say that that's the best way or the only way to do it however that is the majority um, and uh, just seeing on the right I wonder if you guys could hop into chat does anyone know where this illustration was pulled from before I tell you where it was pulled from I'm just keeping my eye on the chat let's see who's the first one to guess 
Yeah, it's a nature journal. Exactly. And why do we all know that? Because it's branded. They branded their science, which is a smart thing to do. And why do we all recognize this is because it's quick to recognize, which means that it's memorable. So oftentimes for myself, as somebody who's a visual learner, I will remember not the person's name of uh, of the article, which is awful when you're trying to sound really smart and intellectual and you can't remember, but you can remember the figure and you're like, well, it had like a blue thing over here and then there was like this other cell component here. So um, branding your science has benefits past just looking nice and making yourself look professional and professionally presenting your science. It's memorable. People engage with it more. They want to learn about it more. And here, so it will pull in readers who might not be so comfortable with the text component of your articles or your science, but might be able to use those illustrations to uh, essentially what they're doing is inferring from graphical representations and coming up with their own conclusions. Essentially, when you ask somebody to write a paragraph or a text in their own words, a visual is allowing people to do that in their heads without having to read your words. And so using all these experiences and this knowledge that I had um, with money gaps, yet, um, I started a business. And so I had a little bit of um, experience with the business world. Um, however, through a nonprofit that I founded in my undergraduate degree, which was Indigo Girls Group, it was a little different. It was still education focused. However, it was for younger people and it was more programming and not really service based. Um, but I took that and those experiences and most importantly, my passion for visual science communication and founded designs that sell. Now, I didn't do this alone. I had a lot of support, including a startup grant, which I provided a few later on for anyone who's interested in potentially starting a business. Um, I also made sure that I had the proper um, the proper accessibility to business education where I needed it. And so I was at Queens at the time, and um, the Kingston Economic Development Corporation is an example of a small business supporter uh, location. But these things exist in any any good sized city. So looking for one near you might be something good. I also found a business mentor, Julia Krolik, who is a leader in the sciacom world in Canada. She was in Kingston at the time. She uh, is the founder of Art the Science, as well as Pixels and Plants, which is a data visualization program. So I get a lot of my business advice from her as well, especially starting out when I really had no idea what I was doing, but really had passion. And so that was great. And of course, I couldn't have done this without financial support from my family as well as uh, my mom's an accountant so obviously that helps with taxes and things when you're starting a business if we're not familiar with those areas. As scientists I find that that's like an area that we're maybe not the strongest in. Um, and so essentially Design Set Cell is just one example of how you can turn a passion into a business and maybe you're attending this webinar because you have a different skill and that's okay. There are all these different types of passions that directly translate into types of businesses. So for me, I took a skill, a talent, and I turned it into a service. However, you know, you might have a skill that um, is more passionate about collecting things, and you know, you can merchandise that way, or maybe you create things and you manufacture something new or innovative. Um, we're all scientists here, so that's something that um, you know you should be inspired by, be creative with it. And um, the only thing that you have to lose is really the time that you put into something, which you're always going to take away and learn something from. And so I'm going to take you through my path now. During my master's degree, um, when I founded Designs SL, it was just me. And uh, this is just a, a little illustration I pulled together yesterday to kind of show the services and how they evolved. Um, and so 2017, when we started this, or when I started this, it was really focused for publications. I also did some work for theses and um, not really anything past that. And so my capability at that time was to complete those things. We started small. Um, and so when I had started the business, um, what I would really recommend for anyone who's interested in, in starting a business and really making profit off of their passions is to fill out a business plan. There are so many online templates, different advice. Um, you're going to have to find one that works for you, that you understand, that you can conceptualize. Um, and come up with some ideas. Ask your friends. Ask your family. Ask people that you know you have in the community. Take me on Twitter. I'll review your business plan if you'd like, um, although I'm not an expert in this area. But essentially what you want to do is just have something in place so that you can think about the different components, both the costs that would be associated with the business as well as the profits and how to where, where is the value in what you do. And, and as Jason has said, you know, Designs That Sell really prides ourselves in being the first research focused illustration program. Like we are researchers, we will take your science and your paper and we will create an illustration from that paper using our background knowledge. And so uh, obviously with only one person that had background in a very specific type of cancer immunology, I didn't really have the expertise to, let's say, focus on something that was totally different. And so our team quickly grew 
And in 2018, uh, you'll hear both from Natasha and Naomi later, so I want to introduce them. We also brought on Nina, um, who excitedly recently has had a new member of her family actually just this week. So um, we we're really excited for her on our team. Uh, and we also included some, some new services that went along with some of the talents that both Naomi and Natasha brought, including educational materials and infographics. After this, um, I actually started medical school in 2018 as well, which was a little bonus. Um, and so after my master's degree, I really still wasn't 100% on what I wanted to do, but I was interested in combining research with clinical trials, and I really liked my time with the CCTG. And so uh, to become a clinical scientist, I wanted to get my medical degree. And so I did um, a year and a half, uh, 2018 to 2019, and half the school year of medical school before I realized that a lot of my time was being eaten up by things that I had to do and not really things that I was passionate about doing. And luckily, I'm so privileged to be in the place where I can say, you know, you know, this isn't for me and I'm not going to pursue this any further. And I actually switched over um, into a PhD program. Uh, but during this time, we got a few new members to kind of support with a lot of the administrative stuff. So Natalie, if you ever engage with Designs That Sell, you'll interact with her and she is a wonderful person. We also brought in Amy Preet, who is fantastic and is working on some 3D modeling um, as one of our illustrators, and Kristen, who is a microscopist who has a Bachelor of Fine Arts that went back to school for a master's. Very inspirational. Um, and so these are some of the wonderful people that we brought on last year. And this year, most excitingly, we have a new service that we're offering, which is essentially for um, people who don't want to commit to having a complete custom illustration created for them. It's a grant figure review or an abstract and poster review. And so for a really reasonable price, um, students or faculty or PIs or, or clinicians can submit a figure and have um, actionable suggestions and revisions given back to them in a way that they can understand and easily do. Um, in addition, we brought on a social media expert, Shannon, and a marketing expert, Katie, as well as another uh, junior illustrator, Molly who is working on many of the projects that we have going on right now with Design and Set Cell. Another big thing that we added was a component of research. And so this is something that Designs That Cell is getting into. Um, as researchers ourselves, we have frequently come into questions that we can't really find answers for. Um, for example, was there a guideline for scientists or clinicians to follow to make effective illustrations? And there wasn't. So that was our first goal was to put something out there, something quick, and easy that people could refer to, almost like a guideline would be produced for some kind of a medical procedure. And so this is the first article that we put out as a team, which was really exciting to write. Um, Natasha and I put out these guidelines, um, essentially going through the different steps for what makes an effective illustration. Um, and I know that a lot of the individuals here, I see that there's a lot of scientific illustrators, but for those who are not scientific illustrators, I would really recommend taking a look at this article, um, let us know what you think about it if you disagree with any components, but more so if anything's really helpful. Um, it's great to know that as well. And essentially what it goes through is when you sit down to start creating a scientific illustration, where do you start? What do you focus on? What are the questions you think about? And I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the uh, first three steps are essentially to understand who you're trying to communicate with to pick a platform with which um, Natasha is going to talk a little bit more about, and then also identify some key points. These are things that you want to do before you even sit down to start an illustration. And if you're working with a client, because I know a lot of you are scientific illustrators, these are really good things to have as questions. Um, and if anyone's curious, we can always share some of the questions that we ask during our, our consultations. And so obviously, I use illustrations as examples. On the left here, you see uh, a picture of a cell. On the right, you have the, the uh, another version of it, incorporating now a plant cell and animal cell. And so I use this example as in if you were going to have an introductory biology class, it's a very different level of expertise that would be needed to understand the illustration on the right versus the illustration on the, on the left. Um, as I said, Josh is going to be talking more about getting started and different platforms that you can use. So I'm going to skip over this. Uh, the third point is probably one of the most important, but it's identifying key messages or points. Um, and so what I always tell scientists who are approaching this is approach it like it's your main results title. If you had to give somebody an abstract, if you had to give somebody three main takeaways, have those written down so that you know what are the main things. And if something else in the illustration is drawing attention or taking away attention, then you know that that needs to be toned down, maybe made smaller, maybe use something more simple to represent it. And I'd be happy to ask questions about these things um, afterwards as well, because I'm rushing through them. And uh, this really isn't the focus of the webinar, but I wanted to make sure that you guys had some, uh, some resources to help develop this as well. 
for those of you who might not be communicating science on the, on the regular. Um, and so step four is layout and composition. These things are really graphic design principles that we simplify so that they'd be understandable, quick and easy to do in the same way that a protocol would be. When you have four different elements, for example, alignment is to keep them all within the same plane. A lot of uh, programs that you'll use have features. For example, if you're dragging things around PowerPoint, you'll see lines come up, those guides. Um, balancing things, so making sure that if you have components that they're balanced. Contrast, essentially, if you want to be highlighting components of those areas. Um, in addition, with balance and contrast, don't be scared of using white space. Um, having things be separate really helps communicate things more effectively. You know, um, I see a lot of scientists who come to me with like these complex illustrations with like 17 different pathways and like eight different drugs. And sometimes it's just better to take the idea and the concept and communicate that rather than all the specifics. And obviously it's going to change based on what you're trying to communicate, but it's important to keep in mind that white space isn't something to be scared of. Um, keeping things consistent, so duplicating things if you're using the same method to contrast components, keep that consistent. And of course efficiency, and in this context we talk about efficiency as planning where somebody is going to start on an illustration and when they're going to end up. And usually that's from, I guess you guys are looking the opposite, it's going to be top right to the bottom left. Um, for me but for you guys you want to be like top left to the bottom right and walk through somebody and you can even sometimes you'll see artists or graphic designers draw lines for how the visual gaze, gaze is going to be moved through the illustration. I'm using my hands a lot because I'm not used to the webinar format and I usually do these talks in person um, but if you guys have questions again let me know. Um, the next step that would be quick is for picking a color scheme so for example um, you want to keep your color scheme as close to physiologically relevant as possible. Don't try to challenge norms. If something's increasing, using green. Something's inhibited, using red. Um, creativity is great, and you can be creative with colors, but if you challenge norms, you're going to start introducing bias into the way that your science is represented. So this is something that you want to be careful with. Um, additionally, consideration whenever you're creating illustrations for lay audiences or the general public, um, or really anybody, because one in five males um, will actually experience some sort of um, some sort of uh, color, um, I don't want to say color blindness because there's like a, a whole kind of spectrum of that, but just being aware of the accessibility and um, you can usually avoid those issues by adding in patterns, labels, not overlapping colors like red and blues. There's a lot of information available online and I'd be happy to chat about that as well. It's just something to consider when you're picking your color schemes. And the next thing is typography or font. I'm just going to quickly briefly talk about this. Um, Naomi actually has a really interesting, um, a really interesting research project right now that she's working on for fonts. Um, essentially, the two main fonts are a sans serif font and a serif font. The serif being those small things that you see at the edge of these letters. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse on here, but I'm trying to click on it right here. Um, so you'll see that these components don't have it. Generally, sans serif are approachable more or are sans is more approachable and easier to read um, if they're used as labels and in specific situations. So for science communication, I like to suggest using sans serifs, although there are situations where um, serif is, you know, not uh, the most appropriate to use. And I've included a link here, a QR code for Google Fonts, which has over 900 um, free downloadable fonts that you can go and explore and have fun and maybe find one that you enjoy, like our, our Papaya Sunrise font that you see here is part of Designs That Sell Branding. Um, so this is just to give you an example. If you were at a conference and you walked up to these posters, looking at the one on the left and the one on the right, um, you'll see that the one on the right is generally more approachable to somebody who might not be comfortable with the subject matter, and that is the, the only difference here because we don't get to see content or the charts really is the font. Um, and the last thing is to replace those placeholders that you have for the layout or the idea that you have with actual illustrations. So um, for those of you who are illustrators, fantastic. You can um, you know, go and illustrate your own things, but not everyone is. And so I've, I've uh, included these two resources for ways that you can apply those science communication strategies and use stock images. Um, I personally love smart survey art. It's like very much my style, very colorful. Um, very bubbly. It's also the style that the Bachelor of Health Sciences program wanted to mimic and um, it's great for communicating science in a simple way and getting what you need across. BioRender is also great for having a large um, essentially drag and drop option for a variety of prefabricated illustrations which you can, I believe you can request 
specific illustrations if they don't have something as well. So that could be a good option as well. Um, I know that um, Survey Art is Creative Commons license um, and it's free to use. BioRender, I believe, is um, a service that you have to pay for, but I do believe that they do have student prices as well as pricing for labs. So that might be something if your team's really passionate about visual communication and you have a funding for it to look into. And so um, I did mention that we're doing other types of research. This summer, uh, we had a fantastic group of research interns at Designs That Sell. A few of them are listed here. And through these, we have started some visual communication projects, specifically looking at different um, areas. So one of our areas is health research. So Sean is looking at how visual communication can be used to communicate some strategies for alcohol misuse treatments. Um, Abdul is looking at how infographics can be used to increase medical adherence, specifically through the lens of iron supplementation. Um, and we're doing this in partnership with the University of Guelph um, to kind of access those individuals who might need this information more than others, potentially translating and focusing on developing countries. Um, and then we have another arm where Jen, for example, is working on creating for graphics and supplemental tools for education for organic chemistry. And that's being done with uh, chemistry professors at the University of Ottawa. And if you're interested in learning more about these, we're actually having a Designs That Sell Summer Student Showcase, so you can drop by, ask questions. It's um, online as well. You can register, I believe, on our website, although Natasha is facilitating this, so she might be able to answer some more questions about it. Um, but in addition to that, uh, I know there are some scientists who are getting into the science communication all, both with social media and marketing. Um, and so we actually had two interns this summer who focused primarily on that, and they'll also be presenting some of the concepts that they learned or some of the research that they did on how to make those things most effective. Um, so for those of you who are thinking of getting started, starting your own business, um, here are just a few options. These are unfortunately specific to Ontario because that's where I started my business and so these are the things that I was looking into. Um, however, if you're interested in starting a business, there are so many resources both on like our federal websites but also in your provincial websites, government funding, um, but also looking into different startups or incubators that might be available within your cities. You'll be surprised at how collegial, supportive, and um, you know collaborative the business world is. Is, um, especially as uh, from a perspective of a scientist who really didn't know what to expect when going in I was really pleasantly surprised um, so yes I think we'll be sharing these slides yeah in the in the coming days so don't worry about that all these links will be available for you as well and then of course if you have any questions I'm happy to answer um, so the key points from my talk and probably others talk that you'll hear later um, is that there are many paths to being a scientific illustrator and um, Starting a business can be really scary, but if you're not, you know, 100% financially reliant on it and you manage your expectations, it can be something that's rewarding past just getting paid to do something that you love. Um, an important thing as somebody who is a scientist and knows how perfectionist some scientists can be, business plans are fantastic, but they're not the same as a protocol. They can change. They need to be flexible. So not treating them as concrete things is really important and being amendable to kind of be adaptive, um, you know, listen to what your clients want, listen to what the needs are and not just, you know, what you think is best. And, and that's a challenge as well sometimes as artists. And uh, the last point is that collectives and having a team um, as part of Designs Itself, for example, you know, we do have a collective where we are supporting fellow, fellow trainees who have these talents, um, essentially being able to market for them. And Natasha will talk about some of the benefits and drawbacks as well. Um, but we also have a, a network and a little family within Designs That Sell. Um, we do socials, we play pictogram with scientific illustrators. It's punnier than you think, but we also have some people who are not illustrators on the team. So pictogram can get interesting and competitive. Um, and yeah, so that's the end of my presentation and my portion. Um, and I'm going to be passing it over to Natasha. But as we're doing the transition, I think we're going to open it up to some questions. I've listed my Twitter there as well as my email for anyone who has any questions. Um, especially any trainees who are interested in doing this. Let's connect. We can chat about things. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Hey, there's a couple of questions in the chat already. So we'll probably do two or three questions before we jump to the next presentation. There will be a question and answer period at the end as well. So if you don't want your question to be part of the recording, you can just hold off until the end as well. Um, and if, yeah, so within the chat, Redima is asking oh, lost my chat 
Uh, what are, are there any open source softwares that you suggest for kind of going through the scientific illustration? You start, you alluded to BioRender and I think it was Smart Can, Scan, Canvas, I believe. Um, any, any other suggestions you might have? Yes, um, Natasha is going to be, yeah, Natasha is going to be chatting about some of those alternatives. So I don't want to steal her thunder, but those questions will be answered um, in Natasha's section. Perfect. Uh, and Ala is asking, um, can you speak to illustrating education healthcare services and some of the concepts? We've alluded to a few of those, but is there anything you'd like to ex expand on? Yeah, I also think this question is probably better suited for Natasha as well, um, specifically because she comes from that public health perspective. Um, we're actually working on a piece that functions as a guide, especially in the current climate and atmosphere of COVID, um, specifically targeted to public health practitioners or anyone who is a health practitioner to be able to communicate information. And, uh, you know, some key things there, are like communicating risk in an appropriate way, um, you know, choosing the language that you're choosing, using a jargon checker, um, being accessible using things like contrast checkers online. These are openly accessible tools and um, I'd be happy to share this um, with you after Jason as well as we are getting this paper up and, and put together for you to share with the uh, people who attended here. And if you follow us on socials, I'm sure we'll be sharing it because we're super excited to be creating these resources. That would be amazing. Thank you. Um, and then Chris Alago. Um, is uh, how do you determine a price? Like how, how did you come with your price? Is it per hour per project? Do you, how do you figure scope and, uh, and come up with uh, that? Yeah, that's like a challenging question because there's a whole you know bunch of ways that you could do it. Um, at Designs itself, because I believe that people should be paid for what they think they're valued, if not more. Um, the way that we function is, is essentially like a collective. And so um, all my illustrators choose their own rate, although I recommend what is an appropriate rate to fit into budgets. And so different illustrators at different levels will um, have a price per hour that they charge. And we line up client projects and their budgets and what they expect. So, you know, a one-time publication or a one-time grant figure looks really different than a textbook. Um, or a book that can be published. So we'll assign illustrators based on both the budgets as well as the expertise that's required. And our price range varies from that. To give you an example, I'd say our like junior, junior illustrators, um, are, you know, sit at a cost of about uh, to the to the person to the client at about fifteen to twenty dollars an hour, and then you know our most expensive illustrators or if we're doing work, for example, with three D rendering. Um, things that are more complicated would look more like $50 an hour. Um, and designs that sell charges uh, a flat fee, which is essentially our overhead cost for our administration, for our social media, marketing, whatnot. And that's how we have the business continue to grow. But our, our profits really are from the clients and they go um, for the most part straight to the illustrator for the work that they do. Being a trainee focused business, we're not focused on making tons of money we're focused on putting the money back into the business to provide more opportunities and that's what we've hopefully shown through our COVID internships thank you Sarah there's a couple more questions but I'm probably going to let Natasha move on and then we'll just hold those for the rest of the questions so you and Irene I'll keep your questions and we'll ask them at the end of the, the session sounds good thank you so much everyone and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions after I pass it on to Natasha all right, thanks everyone. Um, it's great to see everyone and I'm excited to share a bit more about my science journey as well as provide you with some resources about how you can get started on yours. And I realized that I drew a bit of red there on the slide, still getting accustomed to giving Zoom webinars. All right, oh dear. So, um, one moment, please. There we go. Okay, so just a bit of a background as to my journey and kind of how I came to this field. So I started out similar to Sarah in very much like hard science. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree um, at Queen's University focusing on life sciences, specifically being interested in cancer research. And I got accustomed to doing wet lab research and getting into the research world, actually spent 
um, three summers working at University Health Network, which was lots of fun. And that really piqued my in interest into continuing on in cancer research. So I completed my master's of science at Queen's University studying prostate cancer immunology. And that was a really great experience, which I'll be speaking more about. Um, but I, I felt like as someone who loves communicating ideas and sharing science, that um, kind of focused academic research wasn't for me. And I wanted to expand my horizons and look at how I can use the knowledge um, and skills that I gained in academia to share that to improve population health outcomes, which motivated me to kind of switch fields and move into the field of public health. And um, kind of overlapping this journey was my journey into science illustration. So I, as Sarah mentioned, I came on board at Design Set Cell in 2018 as an illustrator, but I was also helping as a company of essentially four people back then. There were lots of things to do in terms of getting a name out for ourselves. So I was assisting and leading social media, updating our website, marketing, and some more things which I'll speak about. And most recently, um, I've come on board as a co-owner of the company, which is really exciting. So, um, the, when I was starting to illustrate my ide ideas, a challenge that I came across during my Master's of Science was that I was trying to connect two different um, biochemical pathways. So I was trying to find a connection between the MAP kinase pathway and some immune signaling um, pathways to show the crosstalk between. And because it was a new idea, um, I couldn't find an appropriate illustration to convey the crosstalk and interactions between the two pathways, which I imagine is something that many scientists come up against because they have a new idea, but then how do you show that idea if the idea hasn't already been represented in the literature? So my solution at the time was to use PowerPoint to generate my own schematic. And these were, they worked well for lab meetings, for any oral presentations that I was giving, as well as showing the, my um, supervisory committee what I was actually doing in the lab. But when it came time to submitting them for a, a publication, I felt like they weren't where I wanted them to be in terms of they were communicating the idea as well, but the overall aesthetic and um, appearance of them wasn't up to par with the publication standards. So at that point, I started using Adobe Illustrator to try and take my illustrations to the next level. So um, I'm just showing a schematic of an image I created in PowerPoint for my MSC. I'm showing a prostate cancer cell and the signaling that ha that's happening there. And you know, I think it's appropriate. It communicates the idea. You can clearly see the pathway. But to try and take it from PowerPoint to Illustrator, I think there was a substantial improvement. So as you can see, there, these figures are communicating, like they're showing the same processes and the same ideas, but just the way that you walk through them and interact with them, the right-hand figure is a lot more engaging and clear and communicates the message better. So that um, really made a difference in the kind of illustrations and images that I was using for my, um, my own personal illustrations. So after, it was around this point that I joined Design Set Style. And I started illustrating some client projects and seeing like what, what are the people wanted um, us to provide in terms of illustration. And I found it easiest um, as a, I, as I was on my learning journey to start with what I knew best, which was cancer immunology. So when we were working with clients, if they're, even if um, their research was maybe not about cancer immunology, but about cancer in general, I felt like that was a good project for me to take on because of my expertise in the field. And while working there, I continued to improve my illustrator, illustrator skills um, and expertise. And it was also great because I gained exposure to the business side of things, which was things that as, a, that as a science trainee, I didn't really know too much about. So I took over managing our social media accounts and trying to grow our following and reach out to any potential clients. 
as well updating our website to reflect our services, our work, um, all those business kind of considerations. And it was also a great opportunity to collaborate with other illustrators on the team, like Sarah, Naomi, and our other team members. So this is an example of an illustration that Sarah completed for the Bachelors of Health Science program, as she was talking about. And I made a caption using, um, I think it's very fun to try and write like engaging and accessible captions. So trying to communicate what's actually happening, what is blastocyst, as well as referencing a Backstreet Boys song to like kind of hook people in and engage them. So as I mentioned, I felt that I wanted to kind of take my communi science communication to the next level and make the transition from speaking, usually speaking with other scientists, to speaking to the public and speaking to diverse audiences who um, did not have an, an explicit interest or understanding in detailed scientific topics. So I wanted to continue to communicate science to large audiences. And it was in public health that I was introduced to the field of knowledge translation. Um, and Sarah briefly al alluded to this in the context of the CIHR um, grant requirements, but essentially this is a way for people to learn from the science that's being produced. And in my program, it was, it was definitely emphasized as a key component of all public health initiatives, because we need to communicate health information and messages to lay audiences I know I would say now as we weather a global pandemic more than ever. But what I found was there was limited like skill development in the realm of knowledge translation, although everyone was really pushing towards doing it effectively and well. So um, I, it was during this point that I started researching as part of my program and practicing making infographics, which combine illustrations with data and text to communicate complex information quickly and effectively. So for example, um, I made an infographic meant for a community um, to inform them about the radioactive gas radon levels in their home and then what they can do to address it. And finally, at Designs That Sell, um, it's been an opportunity for me to expand my horizons, both in terms of illustrating projects, but again, like Sarah mentioned earlier, from the business side of things. So I'm wearing many hats right now as both an, as an illustrator for pro projects, um, working with clients, interacting with clients, I'm still involved with the social media and marketing side of things, learning more about business requirements, um, advising our new research um, component that we've introduced this year and um, building morale and enthusiasm amongst our team members. And just like an overall note about this is that the skills that I learned in academia completing both my master's degrees have been invaluable to my experiences leading at Design Set Cell. Like the skills are definitely transferable um, in terms of like as scientists, we like to learn about things um, and apply them. And that's essentially what I'm still doing. I'm just applying it to something different. So that's kind of where I am on my science illustration journey. And I'm sure you're wondering, how can you start yours? And someone already mentioned in the comments, like, what kind of software can I use to just get started? So I've kind of broken it down into three different components to starting off as an, as an illustrator. The first step obviously is actually doing the illustrations and um, how to do that effectively. The next step is networking with others and using social media to get the, your name out there. And finally, working in the field. So working with clients, um, working as a freelance artist with a company or with a collective. So it was just, jump in with starting to illustrate. So what are some programs that you can start drawing um, with? And I just wanted to say drawing means that you are like actually creating the figures yourself as opposed to assembling them, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So I've listed here kind of three gold, I don't know if they would be gold standard, but they're very common illustration platforms, each with a variety 
of features. So the first one um, in the left-hand column is Procreate, which is um, an app that's intended, it's only for iPads, but it's a very similar interface to like a pen and paper. Um, and in terms of the cost, it is just a one-time fee of, I believe, around $15 to get that. But a limitation to that is the images that you draw um, are of a raster format, which means that they can be pixelated if you blow them up. So for instance, if you were drawing a logo or something and you wanted to then like blow it up to have on a billboard, if you did it in raster form, it would likely not look as good blown up. So that's just one limitation um, of Procreate, but it's a great way to get your feet wet and start drawing um, on an iPad. The next one that I have here is Inkscape. Um, and this is um, a free program and it has a vector graphics interface, which means that the um, work that you're producing is vector format. So you can scale it to a larger size as needed without any kind of quality limitations for the illustration. Um, it is a bit more complex to learn and to use than Procreate, but it has um, a lot of benefits, especially as a free product. And the last one that I have here is Adobe Illustrator, which I'm sure you've heard about. It's often considered kind of the gold standard for many graphic designers in the area. Um, it is, there is a monthly fee of, I believe, $30 a month. Um, but you can create vector graphics again, so you can scale them without losing quality. It is more complex to learn, but it has the benefit of these more complex features to enhance your illustrations. And it's um, optimized for use with other Adobe products. So these are some programs to get started drawing, but there are also many programs available for creating graphics. So assembling, pre-made components such as shapes and other illustrations into something new. So I've just listed five of them here um, with the limitation that there are lots more. So for instance, PowerPoint for making presentations, what I'm doing now. Adobe Photoshop is great as part of the Adobe suite for working with photos and editing them. Picturechart um, is an online software um, specifically aimed for making effective infographics. BioRender, which Sarah already talked about, is kind of a drag and drop platform and has a lot of um, science images available. And finally, Canva, which is another drag and drop platform um, used to make a wide variety of graphics. So those are hopefully some um, springboards for you to get started on illustrating and creating graphics. And there's also some key image basics that I briefly want to talk about. So um, you can make for images, there are file formats. So like I said or earlier, you have these vector images that can be edited and are of a higher quality and can be scaled. So I'm not gonna go through like each point, um, but you can use vectors or rasters for sharing um, as well as colors. So just basically, if you're making digital images, using RGB colors are best suited, whereas if you're using print, using CMYK colors, and picking colors that will convey your mes message appropriately is also a really key consideration. Um, if you're using any kind of fonts in your images, whether that be like to, to label things, or if you're putting together a larger like infographic or something, and there's a lot of text involved, um, it's important to have fonts that convey your message. So Sarah briefly talked about serif versus sans serif fonts. Um, that's one consideration. And also ensuring that you have the appropriate rights to use the font. And finally, um, learning a bit about copyright. So often you can use images and graphics made by others in your own work, depending on the copyright agreement. So, on this slide here, I've listed some key resources and links on each of these topics, and I'm not going to, going to go through them in a lot of depth um, because you will be getting the slides after, but it's kind of a springboard again for you to learn more, as well as um, some practical tools for generating your own color schemes and like some font repositories. And the last point I have when you're starting out as an illustrator 
is just some key ways to improve your skills. And none of these, I think, are specific to illustration. They're when you're learning something, a new skill in general, but try it, start off, see what, um, draw what you know well. So draw, whether that be like a project, a project that you're working on or the scientific pathway you're most familiar with, start there. As well, it's great to see, seek feedback from others in the field. So if you made an image, show it to your colleagues and see what they think. And, and try and ensure that you're hearing diverse perspectives about what you can improve moving forward. Um, as well, I had to put in research as people um, who like science and like research, there is um, definitely a, field, a whole field about visual communication, but just kind of learning the basics will definitely help you on your journey. And finally, practice, because although it's cliche, it does make perfect. So kind of the next step, or the next step that I've laid out in this framework, which may not be applicable to everyone, but um, is to network and specifically use social media as an illustrator to gain a following and potentially interact with clients. So I've just listed some benefits and drawbacks of using this approach. So social media we know is free. We have experience using it. Um, it's a great way to just get your name out there, showcase your portfolio, and potentially connect with other science illustrators and, as well as clients. So people who are interested in commissioning you to make an illustration for them. It's also a way you can kind of see what kind of types of illustrations are needed in the field that you're looking into. As well, it's an opportunity for you to improve your visual communication, sorry, your verbal communication skills as you write text to accompany the image. Um, however, just a caveat, it can definitely be a time sink. Um, and there are other ways of networking that may actually be more profitable in terms of working with clients and making those connections. So perhaps emailing or video chatting, I would say meeting face to face, but during COVID times, um, caveat to that with appropriate physical distancing. And I think uh, our suggestions are, first of all, for social media as an illustrator, if you're looking to get clients, consider where your clients are and like where they're interacting. So for instance, there's a big scientific community, both of PhD students, trainees, postdocs on Twitter. And Twitter also is home to a big science artist community. So Twitter, um, in our experience, has been a great way to actually form those connections with people. And finally, focus on what you enjoy, which is um, just, I think, a key point as you're starting out. And it's, it may seem like it is overwhelming to start doing everything. So just start small, start where you're at, and do what you enjoy. So for me, that was writing funny captions. For you, maybe that's replying to people, replying to other people's tweets and really engaging with them one-on-one. -on -one. So the kind of last step that I wanted to talk about today is actually working in the field and um, working and interacting with clients. So as Sarah mentioned initially, most people in the field work as freelance artists, meaning that they um, are just doing it themselves, essentially. And there are definitely some benefits that go along with that. So the, just generally, like, you are your own boss, so you have the ability to be flexible about projects, clients, timelines, and as well, you decide what happens to the final image, whether you retain ownership or the client has ownership. Um, but some drawbacks are, as a freelancer, you're not just illustrating, you're also marketing yourself and trying to get your name out there. So using marketing tools, using social media, building your website so that people know about you. Um, and because you're doing it all on yourself, on your own, you need to be up to date with managing like client relations, payments, um, as well as any appropriate business requirements, so insurance, taxes, and business license. Um, and when you're working with clients, so people who are commissioning you to do art, there are also some key considerations that you need to think about. So somebody already mentioned in the chat about fees, so how do you decide what, um, what each image is going to cost? Is it going to be based on the number of hours that you spent? or is it going to be a flat rate for the image? 
as well, what happens if there are multiple rounds of edits? Is that accounted for in the budget? And finally, does the client have a budget that they're working with and is that they're unwilling to surpass? There's also the consideration of the timeline. So what does the client request versus what can you deliver? Um, file format, so does, can the client edit the image themselves afterwards, meaning that they need probably a vector file format that can be modified? And finally, image ownership. So will you own the final image and license it to the client? Or will you transfer ownership to the client and then they can use it however they see fit? And if that's the case, do you have permission to use the image for your portfolio, social media, website, et cetera? So these are all key considerations to think about when you are starting as a freelancer. There, there's another option though of working with a collective such as Designs That Sell. And there are, I'm not gonna go through each one um, of the benefits in depth, but essentially it's an opportunity for you to focus um, on illustrating. You have some of the freedoms that you do have as a freelancer for setting your own rates. There's great opportunities for collaboration, network, skills development, and you're still available for other freelance jobs or other work. So if you are perhaps a full-time PhD student, there's still an opportunity to be involved with the collective. Um, however, a percentage or, or fixed fee will go to the company and the company or the client may own the image. So less flexibility with that. And finally, the last thing that I've included here is working with an, a company. So Sarah already showed an example of nature. So working perhaps with a publishing company to be an in-house illustrator. So for the benefits, Again, focus on illustrating. There's great opportunities for collaboration and skills development. And there's the other benefits that come with working at a company in terms of regular salary and any additional benefits. However, um, the flexibility that you have is substantially limited. Um, and in terms of the, like, the fees that are going to the company and the ownership of the image, and as well, you may not be able to take on other jobs. So it may mean no freelance work on the side. So that kind of summarizes the um, Illustrate Network work component of how to become a science illustrator. And I just wanted to leave you with some key points. So kind of, I think a main takeaway point of all of our talks today are that there's many paths, that, that there are many paths to become a science illustrator. And start, what, start with what you know and build from there. You know your own work the best and you can sh um, share that visually with others. Um, and kind of what we've also been talking about today is it's really important to connect with others to help you along the way and get insight and feedback and collaboration. And um, finally, consider where you would want to work and where would work best for you. So are you okay with working as a freelancer or is your goal to perhaps work at a company? Just some points to consider as you move forward. And the last thing I wanted to say is you can do it. Um, it may seem overwhelming, but hopefully from today and your other experiences, you can see that you can get started and there are many ways to bring science illustration into your work as a trainee or potentially um, monetize it and work as a freelancer or with a collective or a company. So with that, I would just like to say thank you to all of you as well as to the ORT for this opportunity. And I'm very happy to connect further um, after the chat, after the presentation, um, my email is listed there. So. Um, Thanks, Natasha. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, we have time for a couple more questions before we move on to Naomi. So uh, one question that came up a little earlier in the chat, and it, the topic of colors came up a few times in choosing colors, but do you use a color wheel often? How Choosing colors that match together, like do you have any techniques? I know in the chat Sarah also uh, provided some resources for uh, using colors and trying to keep them physiologically relevant, but anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I would just say that I use typically, or I start off with an online color scheme, which I listed in these slides, which will be available. It's called coolers.co. Um, and that's where you can either like randomly generate color schemes or 
start off um, importing colors that you would like. So if you, for example, need a red to show blood, then you can put that there and then play around with how other colors look next to it. So that's a really great online resource um, for just picking a color scheme to work off for an illustration. I think, and I forgot to mention that it was Ewing who uh, asked that question. Uh, one other question that popped up was from Patricia around what are the best practices for a client modifiable images and if they request it? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think coming back to like the vector versus raster. So the most image types that we see like PNGs, JPEGs, TIFFs, they can't be modified. So um, for sharing modifiable images using vectors, so typically a .svg file um, will allow the client to open the illustration and modify it in a compatible program such as Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator. Do you, in the con I guess in the contract when you're working with someone, do you have to, to outline if they are allowed to modify and change the image that you created for them? I guess it depends on who owns the, who owns the image and who owns the rights. Yeah, exactly. So at Design Fit Cell, um, we have it set up so that the client will own the final image and modify it or use it however they would like. So um, we, we will ask them initially if they would like it to be modifiable um, so that we know that at the end of the process, they would like that SVG file that they can use and modify however they would like. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple questions around careers, but maybe we'll hold them for the Q&A session at the end. So with that, maybe we'll pass it on to Naomi. Awesome. Thank you. And pleased to meet you meet all of you. I know this is not maybe like the ideal in-person format, but <laughs> what can we do in these times, right? Um, my name is Naomi Robson, as we as said earlier, um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, my path through scientific illustration, um, as well as talking about some formal training for scientific illustration at the master's level, um, and some resources that I found helpful and hopefully you might find helpful too. And I'm going to find out how to click. Oh, perfect. All right. So uh, my path to scientific illustration could really be built, like broken down into maybe four different uh, steps. Uh, firstly, before I entered my bachelor's and then during my bachelor's and then during my master's of human anatomy and joining designs that sell during that time period. And then finally, uh, where I am right now looking into, well, not looking into, going into the master's of biomedical communications in the fall of September 2020. So Previously, essentially, before I chose my bachelor's, I had a passion for both science and art, and I loved both of them very much, And but I had the, the, the notion that I could only choose one, and I, at that time, chose that I would pursue science. Uh, so I began my degree at the University, University of Guelph, uh, pursuing biomedical sciences with the intent of becoming either a researcher or a doctor. And going through this program, I... Something that really changed my path was my involvement with the human anatomy program at the University of Guelph. And the University of Guelph has this really unique human anatomy program where undergraduate students have this, this opportunity to learn about the human body and the human anatomy through, um, through dissection. And it, there's a third year program for it. So during my third year, I was able to take part in this and, and complete some full body dissections, which is really, really cool. And I loved human anatomy after that experience very much. And so I decided I wanted to join the fourth year course. And during that fourth year course, the fourth year course is very interesting in the sense that we're creating learning tools to help other people learn human anatomy, especially introductory human anatomists. And we create things like, for example, the Atlas of the Eye, um, and we create these like detailed dissections as well about certain regions. So we did the uh, deep deep external hip rotators. And we also did a dissection of the orbit. So the eye and essentially the bone surrounding it. Um, so, we, so we had all these projects and a challenge that we faced during it was that um, we wanted to communicate these, these, these anatomical concepts, but there weren't really any illustrations that really showed what we wanted to show. Um, so, we, so we decided that we wanted to make our own illustrations to be able to like bridge that gap and to communicate these concepts. And so that's when I created these illustrations for our atlas, which we called fins um, and atlas of the eye, and also this inferior view of the brain highlighting the optic nerve in green. 
And these are all done, just so you know, this was all done in Manga Studio. So this software is similar to Procreate, except it's on your computer. And it's now been called, uh, rebranded to be called Clip Studio Paint. And I highly suggest it. It's very, very similar to drawing on paper in some ways. It's a bit more intuitive some, than some of these other programs. But these experiences really show, introduced me to this concept of visual storytelling in the sense that for dissections, for example, we'd consider the purpose of our, our dissection. Um, what, did, what did we want to communicate? What did we want students to come out for, of, this, of looking at this dissection and thinking um, and learning about from that experience? And also like with our visuals and our illustrations, like same thing, like what, are they, what is their background and how can we tailor the message to give them what uh, they're what we are hoping to give them. So ultimately this was my first experience in scientific communication and visual scientific communication and I loved it and I really wanted to do more of it. And during this time I had, um, I learned about the University of Toronto's biomedical communications program and this was one of my friends told me about it. She was interested in it as in it. She was interested in it as well. And I was really glad that she told me because it really uh, introduced this possibility of art and science actually becoming being a possibility of being united. Um, so that has been my dream ever since she told me. From there, I decided before that I wanted to do a little bit more in human anatomy. I had done my third year, I'd done my fourth year in advanced study of human anatomy, and I really wanted to continue it. I loved it. Um, so I did a master's degree in human anatomy in that same lab, and I was able to be involved in many different research projects as a scientific illustrator. And it was really cool in many ways, and well, aside from <laughs> aside from just doing the master's, it was very, very interesting. And we were able to actually communicate to um, even an even wider range of audiences from like paramedics to physio pelvic health, physiotherapists, um, and, and more. Um, and these are just examples of some of the pieces that I used during this time. And in, in this time, like all, all these pieces that I'm showing you, they were done in the Adobe suite. I decided that I should probably um, start using those programs. And these ones were done in Adobe Illustrator primarily, some editing, uh, photo editing using Adobe Photoshop. So these are like the books that we created. We created a pelvic health anatomy module, um, and this was, is used by a pelvic health physiotherapist to understand the anatomy prior to learning about that specialty more. Uh, and this is one of the illustrations. Some of you may <laughs> be able to recognize this more easily than others, uh, but it, it's a cut of the lateral view of the pelvis. This is the sake right here. This is the anterior aspect, um, and we're looking at the pelvic diaphragm. Other illustrations that I was able to, to contribute to, for example, were these pictures in Summerfest. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not, but um, I'm in the purple, those were some illustrations we created to engage younger children with science and with human anatomy and give them an experience of understanding that deeper intricacy of, of anatomy and how it interacts with ourselves. And I also had the chance to be create a scalpel guide. Um, and the scalpel guide was this resource because since we're learning through dissection, obviously we're using scalpels and um, just to help individuals to use the scalpel safely. Another thing that happened during my master's is that I've created this association called the Human Anatomy Art Association. And it was, essentially it's a group of individuals who are all passionate about art and science. And we all come to the lab regularly to draw and learn from each other and create learning tools for other introductory anatomists as well. Um, I saw that there's a need for art in human anatomy, especially when it's such a visual topic. And it, it, it did really well. We had over 50 participants who were involved in it in some capacity. And some of them are actually shown in this picture here with a photo board that we had created. My face is in it, as well as Dr. Lorraine Jadeski, who's the director of the Human Anatomy Program. And these are some of the crew members that are, are in this group. The final thing that happened during my master's is that I joined Design the Set Cell. And it's been an absolutely incredible experience. I've learned so much and it's so amazing seeing the team as it grows and grows. And during this, this role, I, I got to do some more illustrations, an example being the one shown in this, um, shown on the slide and um, which has been really fun. And I'm also doing research at this time and I'm looking at the impact of fonts actually on visual scientific communication and finding interesting results. Currently where I'm at at this moment is um, I was accepted to into the Masters of Biomedical Communications program at the University of Toronto, which I'm extremely excited about. And I'm in the class of 2022 and I'm beginning in a month or so, I guess. So very excited about that.
So this is where I'm at on my scientific illustration journey. But as we've talked about, there are so many paths and, um, and I wanna to talk to you about how there are so many paths in the concept of board certification, uh, which I'll get into. And also so many paths in terms of getting into these graduate programs uh, for scientific illustration, if that's something you're interested in. So don't look too much into this illustration yet because <laughs> um, I'm gonna be going through this quite a few times and I'm gonna be bringing it back up. Um, but I wanna talk a bit about those paths as I mentioned about board certification and training. But to understand those, I think it's important that we first understand the AMI. So the AMI is called the Association of Medical Illustrators and it's this really large association that is, I guess, almost 100 years old. <laughs> it's 80 years, I guess around 80 years old or so at this point, founded in 1945. And it's dedicated to promoting this advancement of medical illustration and visual communication. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit about those programs that they're doing to encourage that. And they're, fo they're, they're focused on fostering this understanding and cooperation with uh, health science professionals. Right now, like because of all of their actions during COVID-19 and they have, they've been doing many different things to try to facilitate, like for example, they have a, a group of shared document where they share all their COVID-19 research so that they're all up to date in the field. So they've been working very carefully um, to communicate this COVID-19 situation. Um, and they've been listed by associations now as being one of the top 100 associations that will change the world. The AMI has many different components and honestly, I, this presentation would be years too long. Uh, oh, no. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. I'm not. Okay, for a minute, I thought I was muted and I was like, worst nightmare in the world. Okay, anyways, sorry. Please ignore me. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so there's many different components of the AMI 2019 and um, no, AMI, um, the, sorry, Association of Medical Illustrators. And honestly, like if I were to go into them, it would take me probably the rest of the day. So I'm just going to spare you from spare you all from all of that. Um, but some components that they have are you can get a membership, um, and and that gives you some gives you some benefits as well. They have an annual meeting. Um, their annual meeting was in Milwaukee last year, and currently for this year, they have something a little different, which I'm going to share at the end of this presentation. Um, they have a source book, which I highly suggest, suggest checking out, like partly for the inspiration of it, because it has many different really gorgeous pieces. Um, and essentially, I, from what I understand, the members actually get a chance to post in this book and medical professionals or anybody who's needing some kind of scientific illustration can actually look into this source book and try to find the fit of scientific illustrators that they want to communicate for their project. They also have that concept. They also are affiliated with board certification, which I'm going to talk about. And they, to help to facilitate making sure that we're up to date in the field as scientific illustrators, they help to develop these accreditation programs. Um, and their their list of what is expected, I guess, in these programs is what we can, I, is, I guess that is how I'd say it, are guidelines that are used by the Commission of Accreditation of allied health education programs. And this is an organization that um, essentially is important in accreditation for um, like medical goals and like all these um, health education um, programs outside of it as well. So the AMI, when it comes to board certification, it's, an endorse, it's something that it endorses. And this is the logo of what the board certification um, symbol would be. And if you can see a lot of websites with these sort of certified medical illustrators and they'd have this on the bottom of it or, or somewhere on it just to show this. Um, it's, it's just a, it, it, it's a measure of, me of professional competency. So um, it's not essential. You don't need to have it to practice as a medical illustrator, um, but it gives you a designation. So for example, you'd get the board, the letter CMI after your name. Um, it's, and essentially what um, it includes is you have to do this kind of written test and the written test is a whopping five hours, um, and, but not too bad. And it has business practices, ethics, biomedical science and drawing skills. Um, and it goes over this concept and it's only in English right now at this time. Um, and it's more looking at the or American business um, practices. I'm sure there's some similarities though between Canada as well as the States. Um, and the other component of it that you have to complete within two years of completing this test is you have to do a portfolio review. And this portfolio review is only eight pieces um, and it's reviewed by people who are established in scientific illustration and they will look over your pieces and give you, um, you have to get reach a certain score. There's more information about this all on their website, including some practice questions that you can see, like they're very interesting. Um, and honestly, the questions are not quite so bad. Um, as I made it out to be with the five-hour statement. 
Um, so this, this certification is actually renewed every five years. Um, so all you have to do is complete 35 hours of continuing education training, which is, which is something they have to prove um, in advance. But the, the thing about this is that if you want to get board certified and have this, uh, this measure of competency, um, you need to meet these eligibility criteria. So that's when we come back to this illustration and we're going to focus on this part. And this part essentially is the preparation for board certification. And essentially we have our scientists of scientific artists and going into this with either no degree or other or another scientific illustration program that is not accredited. Um, they can the, the need to work in scientific illustration for five years or if you're from one of these master's programs, um, the tr having that be the training to prepare for board certification. But I'm going to go through that in just one second. So these are like the trainings uh, off the, the master's uh, level accredited uh, programs. And there's only four of them in North America, but um, there's, one in, there's one in Canada and there's three in the United States. So John Hopkins, Augusta University, um, University of Chicago, Illinois, and University of Toronto, Mississauga. Um, and Generally, like I'm not going to go through all these requirements. This, you're going to get all this information later, but these are the requirements for this program. Uh, it varies by institution. So if this is something that you're interested in, I highly suggest looking at this earlier because um, there's it's very unique across these different programs. And if you can simplify your work by making sure things can overlap as much as possible, um, that is probably the best. But generally, with sorry to go backtrack to that, they want a portfolio and they um, and they need some rep, they need three references and a curriculum vitae, um, and that's generally the same. But with these masters, uh, something that's really awesome with these with this masters is that students come from very diverse backgrounds. So uh, there's no cookie cutter expectation for what who you have to be when going into these programs. So just looking at the Meet Students page at the biomedical communications program. So there are students who come from life sciences, neurobiology, psychology, finance, and I have a friend who's going to the program this year with me and he's in engineering, which is really cool. Um, and then there's graduate degrees, like I come from a master's in human anatomy. And there's also a lady who's there, I think she's graduating this year, and she is, um, I think her name's Evelyn Lockhart, and she has amazing art. And she is, uh, she actually completed medical school and now she's, she came back to school to do medical illustration. And the one thing that they all share in common is that everybody shares this passion for science and art and them coming together. In these programs, it's really cool is that everything is um, an art and science, art science combination for courses. Um, these, all the courses are in much smaller learning communities. So it's 18 students in each year uh, and everybody is very close. It's a very big community, um, very commu big community aspect, I guess we could say. Um, and these courses are so interesting because they tie art and science together and afterwards it accumul accumulates into this master's research project. So as an example of that, the human anatomy course involves a full body cadaveric dissection. And then with that, so we're learning the science, but we're also making illustrations at the same time suitable for medical textbooks, um, which is kind of cool. And they also talk about things like ethics and professionalism and business practices. So as I mentioned before, with the board certification test, the, these are things that they test on that, on that test. Um, so it would cover those, um, it, co it, it teaches you everything that you would need to prepare. And here are some examples of master's research projects that I took from the Biomedical Communications website. And you can check out these videos. They're all quite good. There's a lot of variety. Um, it doesn't have to be a video piece from what I understand. In this master's, a lot of different programs as well. So you have, you, you learn things like ZBrush, Maya, you learn how to do animation, Cinema 4D, um, the Adobe Creative Cloud is probably your best friend. And Tableau, for example, we, we use that as well. And these are only some of the programs that, we, that you would get to use in these programs. So ultimately, we, so going back to this illustration, you can either go into, the, like, if you decide that you wanted to do board certification, this period of which you're working either in scientific illustration for five years or coming from an accredited master's program essentially prepares you for that option of cho choosing if you want to pursue board certification or no board, board certification. So, and the thing that I want to stress as well with that is that board certification is an option. You can still work as a scientific illustrator without it. Um, but with that training, you can choose at that point after five years to do the either. But I also want to mention that if you want to do that and you do not have a degree or the, or the 
in, in science field illustration or you come from another program, like it's important that you have an anatomy course from what I understand and some letters from employers. So that's, those are things to think about, but you can see more about that on the, on the website. So some key points that I wanted you all to take away today is that firstly, again, that many paths exist in scientific illustration. There's no one cookie cutter cut, uh, cookie, cookie cutter uh, path about what you need to do to get to this to, to scientific illustration. And it's not just for being a scientific illustrator itself, but it's also through these graduate programs as well. Like getting into these graduate programs, uh, there's no defined path. Board certification is an option. If, you, if that's something you're interested in, you want that, um, and you want that push to make sure that you're doing all that continuing education, that is an option. And um, with that, they're trained. And also, find, and the third thing being, I want you all to take away is that there are training programs for medical illustration. Um, and there are four accredited ones in North America. And again, to start early, if you want to look into these graduate programs or look, and look into the websites for requirements, because they are not the same. For resources that I wanted to off to you all that I found very useful during my time looking into medical illustration was firstly the AMI. Um, I highly suggest checking it out to look about their look for more information about board certification and their annual meetings. They do a lot of different things. Uh, so definitely just taking the time to look through it. This year, something that they're having that I mentioned earlier, because they don't have the conference, in-person conference this year, um, they're having the AMI 2020 webinar series, which is, which sounds honestly incredible. And it has educational sessions, technical work, work showcases, workshops about the AMI, networking, so much more. And I didn't even include, I did not include all of them at all. Those are only the first four things that they mentioned. So, and it's, it seems very reasonable. Um, and the price, uh, considering price and everything, and it's, you can access it from your home. So that's one great way to learn about scientific illustration some more. Also, like you don't have to just look into the, to the AMI. There's other scientific illustration organizations as well. And I'm listing a couple of them here. The GNSI, they actually had a, a conference recently that was virtual. And what's awesome, the one awesome thing in this, in this time of COVID is that there are online workshops. So you don't actually have to go anywhere. You can just stay, stay at home in your PJs and just learn about scientific illustration at home. And I highly suggest checking out their, these organizations, following them on Instagram or, not, or Twitter, um, and learning about their events, connecting with their members, and seeing uh, what's going on in the field right now. Also connecting with those professors at these schools. Um, I like twi on Twitter from John Hopkins, all of these schools connecting with them on there. Another resource that I found really useful was the BMCAA, as well as the Meet the Students. Uh, my focus when I was applying for medical illustration was more on U of T because I wanted to stay in Canada. Um, and I highly suggest if you look at U of T, and I'm sure the other programs have this too, they have a Meet the Students tab. And you can look at the students and you can, uh, you can actually read their bios and you can also see their websites, which is really cool because if you look at it as well during across a period of time, you can see their art grow as they add more things to their websites, which is kind of exciting to watch. Um, and then also look at the alumni. The Alumni Association, the BMCAA, is excellent. Um, it, they have a lot of events. And for example, they have some really fun events right now um, about learning how to draw faces by Ryan Park. And there's another, uh, I think it's Wendy Gu. She created, there, there's this um, <laughs> succulent cupcake art. It was, it's absolutely gorgeous. And they're all so very talented. And it's a great way to get to connect to these, these very talented individuals. The whole community is extremely supportive. Everybody I've talked to has been very patient and um, very helpful. Um, and so with that, like follow leaders in the field and get inspired, follow people who have graduated and be inspired from them. And like also know that if you have any questions about anything that I'm talking about, like feel free to reach out to me as well. I'm gonna leave my information at the end and I would love to answer any questions. And a final resource that I want to share that I found helpful is SciArt Now. And honestly, SciArt Now has been growing and growing and growing with what it has and what it offers. I think now it offers a podcast, which is pretty cool. And Annie Campbell is uh, putting in it and she has a lot of great resources. Um, and they post things like resources. They post everything about all these different um, schools. They post job postings, um, tutorials. Also the art on their website is brilliant. I think they hosted a medical art um, in October um, and it seemed very popular among the scientific illustration community. So they're definitely another place to uh, group to check out. And that's everything. Um, so thank you for listening to this, to, my aspect presentation and everything and um, if you have any questions please reach out that's my email right there and I also have my Twitter there if you'd like to message me at, um, there as well um, 
And thank you.